Yo, what's awesome guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to History Summarized Island, and this video is three years old. I mean, it's not like this is going to be history from the past, so it's not like oh, recent history is going to be involved in this, I assume. Although Ireland, although at the same time, I think Ireland, even at this time, was the same, is becoming one of the richest countries in the world, which is, I mean, I don't know. I've not really looked into videos as to why, but I've seen videos pop up in my suggested tab, and it's to do with, like, how Ireland's becoming the richest or how this and that which is good to see obviously for a country that was put through so much shit i probably shouldn't swear at the start you should point like that um it's good to see them prospering and doing really well for themselves and I, I probably will do a reaction to a video related to that at some point but i was like i'd done a reaction about a year ago maybe a bit more a bit less about the potato famine and basically just how britain or more so england killed many people through horrible like ways pretty much and i mean being from england you don't really learn about this stuff although i didn't pick history after when, year nine which is when i was like 14 or 13 14 so maybe they learned it then i don't know but throughout primary school and then high school i didn't ever le learn about this and i've pretty much only learned through my own sort of means basically on youtube and through reactions and i had a lot of people commenting saying they appreciated the fact that i went out of my way to do that or just stuff like that and yeah learning about history is obviously important and i know england or britain i say britain but it is pretty much england has done so many horrible things and yeah you gotta learn about that because i mean i live in a city where i feel like i have a pretty decent life obviously england's not the best place to live for many reasons but it's also somewhere where I feel like I'm pretty blessed to be here. And it's probably down to the fact of these horrible things that have happened in the past. So I've got to recognise that. But we're going to learn about this. Obviously, this is the history summarised. So hopefully this is going to show some positives from the history and not just focus on that stuff. But maybe that's where a lot of it is. But we're going to jump into this anyway. Um, and yeah, let's check this out. On the surface, the history of Ireland seems like the tale of one island getting beat up for over a thousand years straight. And, well, that's not incorrect, I'll be honest with you. But from another perspective, it's a story of a unique civilization rising from the intersection of two very different worlds, and then remarkably enduring through centuries. Why is it gone so blurry? of subjugation and hardship. When it's all too common to see entire cultures wiped from existence because of colonial oppression, Ireland is a very hard-fought counterexample. To see what makes Ireland's history so special and to learn how Irish cultures survive to the present day, let's do some history. This video is brought to you by Audible. More Getting his money? Oh, he's gonna do it at the end, actually. More on that later. Our story begins with the migration of the Celts from Central Europe sometime in the 5th to 3rd-ish centuries BC. Okay, look, it's an ancient migration, all right? Dates are gonna be finicky on this one. And they settled on this little island here, which they named Eire after the goddess Eiru, which I maybe said right? I don't know. I'm just gonna try and say as few Irish names as possible so I don't embarrass myself, which is where we get the name Ireland. And speaking of language, they spoke an early version of Irish, which is a subset of the Gaelic language family, which is a subset of the Celtic language family. Not confusing at all. Though Ireland's didn't have a written literary tradition, the culture venerated storytelling bards, as well as druids, who are priest-like figures that doubled as historians, judges, and even doctors. Another popular profession in Ireland was, surprisingly enough, king, because there was no overarching central authority, so Ireland usually had somewhere around 150 local Tuatha that each had their own king. Wow, so there's multiple kings. Fair enough. And there were no cities at this point either, so people just clustered into groups on available farmland and got to it. Though Ireland wasn't politically unified, they shared many elements of art and religion, from Celtic knots to Ku Cullen. Irish mythology is rad, and you can see some examples here, but there are also all manner of gods, heroes, and some pretty bonkers magic too. Sadly, we don't have as much information on them as we might like because the Irish mythological cycle wasn't codified until centuries later, and parts of it have since been lost. Plus, the stories themselves sometimes conflict with one another on account of how regional these oral traditions were. Though we today only know so much about early Celtic Ireland, the picture gets clearer and the culture gets richer with Ireland's second big arrival, Christianity. Ireland actually got the good end of the deal on this one, because their conversion was peaceful and it didn't involve them getting invaded by Rome. Win-win, and quite the opposite in fact, as Irish pirates often found their way to the western coast of Roman Britain. In one instance, a captured young Roman lived in Ireland for six years before escaping back to Britain, and after some soul-searching he trained in 
France to become a priest and set back out to Ireland in the hopes of converting the people to Christianity. Though he wasn't the- How have they got a story from this specific person? I, f I always find it so wild how they'll just gra they'll find these individual stories. I don't know how true this is. I assume it is true. That's so crazy to me that they've managed to just fight through history. This story's just managed to stay known. Maybe it's changed a bit here and there, but fair enough, man. The first missionary to Ireland, this Saint Patrick, as you've probably guessed, was certainly the most consequential. The dates for his oh, this is Saint Patrick. So he's wait, Saint Patrick's day. Is is he gonna be? Wait, I'm kind of baffled. I'm kind of baffled now. Was that St. Patrick? Life and career are all over the place, and there's even a theory that St. Patrick is actually an amalgamation of two different characters, but this show is history summarized, and I am super not qualified to settle very much ongoing debates in the academic historical community. Oh, but what we enough. can say for certain is that he never drove the snakes out of Ireland, because Ireland never had snakes. That's just a very polite code word for pagans. And even that isn't fully accurate. Patrick. Buddy, you're killing me here. Because Celtic culture didn't just go away. It's a classic example of syncretism, where the goal is to make two disparate cultures coexist rather than have one completely supplant the other. Latin was introduced, but it was spoken right alongside Irish Gaelic. Monasteries were built all around the islands, but they were regionally autonomous. Jesus was the new number one, but the old Irish mythology remained firmly in the popular conscience best of both worlds. And the timing of all this couldn't have been better, because while mainland Europe was splintering out into dozens of Gothic kingdoms in the wake of the Western Roman Empire's collapse, Ireland just got a jolt of new culture to play with and about 400 years of complete peace to refine it. The strongest yeah, literary tradition in Europe was made in Irish monasteries, often called scriptoria, where accounts of old Irish mythology were written alongside beautifully decorated manuscripts of the Bible. All around, Ireland was known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars, and it's because of their hard work that so much ancient Latin work survives today. Irish missionaries to Europe even laid the groundwork for Charlemagne's 9th century renaissance in France. It's also during this golden age that we see, and hear, two core symbols of Irish culture, the Celtic cross and the harp. The cross appears in stone all over Ireland, and it's a perfect visual metaphor for how Celtic Irish culture is literally woven into Irish Christianity. Again, all this while the rest of Europe was having some serious, eh, let's call it growing pains. Although Ireland was decentralized in both government and religion, it enjoyed over four centuries of peace between the numerous Tuatha and no threat of invasion. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, uh. and all shiny things must get raided by Vikings. And speaking of Vikings, Vikings. Though Ireland's didn't quite get hit as bad as the English and Scots one island over, Ireland saw its fair share of coastal looting and burning. Monasteries were an easy target because of their abundance of treasures like genstone covered manuscripts and their non-abundance of defensive fortifications. The Vikings did, however, contribute Ireland's first cities of Dublin, Cork, Waterford, and others settled along the island's coasts. And as the Vikings got comfortable in their cities and chilled out enough to stop with the damn raiding all the time, their cities became hubs for trade and production. Ultimately, though, Ireland's much bigger problem for the next thousand years would come from right across the channel. And oh golly gosh, would you look at the clock, it's time to complain about England, whoo! <clears throat> Sorry, professionalism. So while Ireland was having a good time minding its own business and not bothering anyone else, the Anglo-Normans came over to establish the Lordship of Ireland, which sounds a lot more, uh, complete than it actually was. England held on to the urban population centers in the east, but because of stuff like wars and plague, it was pretty patchy for the next five centuries. But in 1509, Henry VIII became- I don't realize how long this history, like the sort of, the terrible stuff from England really lasted, like how long ago it was. Because I know it's a, a bit more recent history, but this has been going on for a thousand plus years, which is mental to think about came king and decided that he wanted to be a really big deal, so it's here that things start getting rough. See, Henry converted to Protestantism after oh, he got tired go. of killing his wives and wanted to just divorce them instead, but Ireland remained firmly Catholic. This displeased Henry, so he made a new push to colonize Ireland, and England made steady progress in beating up on the Irish, taking more and more of their land, and busting down their monasteries and churches. Unsurprisingly, the Irish rebelled. Several times. In the decade after the union of the English and Scottish crowns in 1603, King James confiscated Irish land in the northern region of Ulster to make way for Scottish colonists to start private plantations. And this marks the start of a couple unfortunate defining trends for the next three centuries. First is the treatment of Ireland as a subservient colony and the steady seizure of Irish land, and also the persecution of Catholicism through strict social laws. In the 17th and 19th centuries, Irish farmers became tenants in their own island, and this process only accelerated with the advent of anti-royalist and civil war extraordinaire Oliver Cromwell, who murdered his way across Ireland during his War of the Three Kingdoms. 
kingdoms. More land was confiscated, Catholic Irish were forcibly evicted and also banned from certain jobs, and for the next 300 years, Ireland was regarded as little more than a conquered colony. Although the wow. anti-Catholic laws were largely repealed by the turn of the 19th century, Ireland was still poorer going into the 1800s than it had- So basically, it was a country that was left on its own, just slowly building its way up, and then this 800 plus years happened. Or well, at this point in time, what, 500 years? 400, 500. He says 300, but I think it was before that as well. Um, and they've just been held back pretty much. It's crazy how all this time it was held back. And even like after all of that, in this current day, they've managed to prosper and do so, that like, the country's done so well, it, well for itself and the people had arguably ever been, as its production and wealth were systematically siphoned off to Britain. Only the majority British pockets of the island in Dublin and Ulster saw much improvement, and it was these Ulster Irish who spoke for Ireland in the new United Kingdom's parliament. If this all sounds short-sighted, exploitative, and extremely fragile, you'd be correct. Yeah. But wait, it only gets worse. Oh, See, God. Ireland's agriculture was, well, Dangerously precarious. Most of their food production was beef exports to Britain, and that didn't leave a whole lot of available farmland on Ireland for feeding the Irish. So the tenant farmers turned to potatoes, which had by far the most nutritional value for the space they took to grow. Not super great that the systematic exploitation of their land forced Catholic Irish to subsist entirely on a single food staple for generations, but at least they're not starving. What I find so baffling about this is it's not even that long ago. Like in human history, this is not long ago at all. You'd expect this sort of thing to have happened five, six, seven hundred years ago. No, it's not even two hundred years ago. It's absolutely mental. So anyway, in 1846, the potato blight hit Ireland and all of the crops failed, so people started starving. Cool. <sighs> the thing is, potato crops were going rotten all across America and Europe. Ireland was just the only place where potatoes were the only option. But with a crisis at hand, Parliament acted swiftly to provide rations and relief to... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Parliamentarians in London insisted that the reports of famine were completely overblown and oh refused to divert God. resources for aid. Help did slowly arrive, but it was predicated on putting Ireland through economic reforms to modernize their infrastructure. Yeah, because that's exactly what Ireland was asking for not food god no laissez-faire mercantilism way to read the room guys eventually the blight passed and things slowly returned to normal but not before one in seven people died of starvation and one in four fled to places like america this would be why new york and boston have big irish communities that materialize out of nowhere in the late 1840s the more you know. And real quick before we move on to the 1900s, it's not a coincidence that the areas least affected by the famine were the Protestant parts. And if that wasn't bad enough, Britain was also busy shutting down the last remaining hedge schools that taught Greek and Latin to Catholic kids. Before this, Ireland's Catholicism had produced the longest cont- Wait, so- and were the Protestant parts. And if that wasn't bad enough, Britain was also busy shutting down the last remaining hedge schools that taught Greek and Latin to Catholic kids. That is so fucked, man. I hate like the, the fact that we've lost like languages or cultural things because of them being shut down and all this sort of stuff man that just pisses me off it's before this ireland's catholicism had produced the longest continuous tradition of by we i mean the world like in this case irish people and stuff like that but that's so annoying to me greek and latin anywhere on earth but god forbid kids who aren't anglican be allowed to learn gross so, what to do from here? Well, if you're the population of Ireland in the early 1900s, the answer was literally anything else, and that echoed in a call for home rule and their own independent government. However, Ulster was still fiercely unionist, and it almost looked like pro-union and pro-home rule paramilitary groups were going to start fighting about it when World War I suddenly became a much more pressing issue. But on Easter of 1916, Irish insurgents occupied government buildings in Dublin, so the British army shelled them into surrender and then executed the rebel leader. This, you may guess, did not sit super great with the Irish public, so as soon as the World War was over, Ireland fought a guerrilla war of independence, and in 1922 it was granted home rule as their own free state under the British crown. And in the late 30s and 40s, Ireland transitioned into a fully independent republic. Ulster, however, opted to stay in the UK and became known as Northern Ireland. The split between North and South came to a head in the latter part of the century, as Northern Irish Catholics still faced heavy discrimination, and their peaceful protests met violent opposition. And this erupted into the Troubles. Three decades of insurgency, terrorism, and police. See, I don't know much about this more recent history as well. I know it's terrible, and it's kind of crazy to think that stuff so close to home 
was happening at this point in time. And I mean, I probably need to do videos focusing more on this as well to learn about it, but it's just horrible to think about. Police brutality in Northern Ireland, as IRA irregulars fought against Ulster Volunteer Forces and British police to end British rule in Northern Ireland. After some 3,500 casualties, most of them civilian, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 mandated that Northern Ireland could vote to unify with the Republic at any time they liked, and that there would- But why was this only done in 1998? Surely this, in the world that we're in, you would imagine this would have been a thing that would have been signed years and years ago not fucking 25 years ago never again be a hard border on the island between north and south oh geez, dear god not again Whew, criminy even when irish history lets up it doesn't let up meanwhile the republic of ireland enacted a series of economic and political reforms to lift the it's beautiful by the way this place looks fucking beautiful country out of hundreds of years of poverty and today the people of ireland are bro i need to go here one day because this place looks fucking incredible safer richer better fed and freer to express their religion than they've been in centuries it's distressing to see ireland so cruelly oppressed for so long but it's inspiring to see the past century's reclamation of irish culture and their long-deserved independence Imagine my shock. The country prospers once. I say Britain, but again, pretty much England just lets them do what they want to do. Imagine my shock. Bro, Ireland looks crazy nice though. In Ireland, history is never far away. The legacy of their centuries-long golden age is everywhere from the Celtic cross to the Irish language. And the painful memory of the Great Famine has motivated Ireland to become a world's leader in international food aid. And I will gladly raise a pint to that. In ancient Damn. Ireland, monks had to copy entire manuscripts by hand, but now it's never been easier to get instant so access. Getting his money? Come on, man. You love to see it. <coughs> I'm going to read some of the comments, but I just need to clear my throat. The most infuriating thing about the famine is we actually were producing enough food, but it was all being exported to Britain. <sighs> Fucking hell. At no point did they stop th and think, hey, maybe we should let the starving people produce our food. Yeah, it's a bit fucking wild to even think about, to be honest. Fun fact is, possible Ireland had the first legally upheld right to healthcare in history. Holy shit, as well as protections and rights for the mentally ill. This was about 1300 years ago. Not so fun fact, the population of Ireland. Yeah, this is wild to me. I remember learning about this in a previous reaction. It's lower than it was in the Great Family. That's wild to think about. And it also the... Um, Native Americans as well, the Choctaw. I've learned about that as well. Crazy to think about that. So far away, in that time, they were still getting support and help from from people so far away. I can't understand that, to be honest, in those times. Um, but it's it's wild to me because again, I growing up, I didn't know it. Like when I was young, young, I didn't know about any of this sort of history. Obviously, when you're young, you don't know this sort of stuff. And I always had, I always like, because I mean, just countries nearby I just liked. And I always just thought I really liked Ireland. And then from then, like Irish culture, like, I don't know, I'm going to say Irish fighters, but the sort of the Irish humour. It's just, it's something about it that I just find it stands out in such a, in such a nice way and enjoyable way. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about like, I don't know how they feel about him now, but like Colin McGregor and that sort of humour. And then like going with the accent, it just makes things so much better and funnier, like when you're sort of trying to take the piss out of people. And I mean, I know in Ireland there's they support um English teams. I don't know where like what's more popular, Irish football teams or English football teams in Ireland. But I know like they support Liverpool and like Manchester United. I think they're the two like big teams there. I think that's also down to the fact that there's a lot of Irish people or Irish culture in Liverpool. I could be wrong with that. Don't don't shoot the messenger, but I feel like that's the case because they're quite close. I guess it's like a sort of that's one of the closer areas of England and Ireland. But um, yeah. I mean, this is a a video of me learning. I hope I don't offend people when I sort of do this because I am going into this not knowing much at all, and I know it is a touchy subject. But I'm here to learn, right? And in the comments, let me know as well if you want to see some more reactions of me learning this stuff. Let me know in the comments, but God damn, it's, it's kind of satisfying to see a country that was held back and treated so badly now prospering more than the country itself that was trying to hold it back.
it's so wild how things change but hey that's how the world is and that's happened with a lot of other countries that were held back or colonized and controlled by britain in the past but yeah let me know your thoughts and yeah until next time peace